Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where all of us nature lovers have to agree at any, any given time, it gets a little bit weird out there. From the hammerhead shark to the duck-billed platypus to a spider known as the bird dung spider, because it looks like I'll, I'll let you draw your own conclusions to some of the animals you're going to meet tonight. There's some strange things out there in the animal kingdom with faces only a mother can love. And tonight we're going to get up close and personal with them and understand why, even though they may look a little bit different or unique, we should love them all just the same. We've got the star of Brave Wilderness, Coyote Peterson here, who's been up close and personal with pretty much every animal out there to teach us about the stranger things of the animal kingdom and give us a tour of some of these really amazing, if, if also awkward animals. Now, Kyle is going to ask you some strange questions. So make sure you, uh, you're using that chat box to the right of the screen here to answer his questions and throughout the class. If you've got anything uh, on your mind that you want to ask Coyote, ask those questions there as well. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I'm going to interview Coyote with your questions to get as many answers as we can for you. Also have a camera nearby because before we get to your questions, we're going to invite everybody to lean into the screen and get kind of a strange selfie with Coyote. If you upload it to Instagram after class, tag Coyote Peterson and tag, tag Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a prize package that includes Coyote's hat and an entry in wildlife camp with Varsity Tutors this summer so you can learn even more exciting and exotic things about animals. So with all that, it's time to get a little bit weird today. Coyote, I know you're excited to talk to us about the stranger things of the animal kingdom. So let me introduce you everyone to your teacher for today, Coyote Peterson. Hey, what's going on guys? Brian, thank you so much for the wonderful intro. Now, if this is your first time joining a class, this is actually my third one here with Varsity Tutors. I'm thrilled to be back. But if this is your first time in class and you have no idea who I am or why I've got this cowboy hat on my head, I host a channel called Brave Wilderness on YouTube. I've also got a show on Animal Planet called Brave the Wild. And I get up close and personal with some of our planet's most bizarre and creepy looking creatures. I also get up close with some of the cute ones too. So after class, if you're looking for some more animal education, conservation messaging, and entertainment, definitely check out the Brave Wilderness YouTube channel. But tonight, we are going to talk about stranger things of the animal kingdom. And trust me, there are some strange creatures out there that we are going to be talking about. I put together an awesome lesson plan for us tonight. We've got some videos. We've got some questions. We're going to have some hangout time with me at the end. So if you guys are ready, let's get into class. And before we get into the educational part, first, I want to ask you guys a question. Our first question of the night, what is the strangest animal you have ever seen? I'm gonna give you guys a couple of seconds to answer this. There's technically no wrong answer, so go ahead, fill in your answers. I'm gonna start calling some of them out as I see them off to the side here. Uh, oh, jellyfish. Jellyfish is definitely a really good one. Your little brother, uh, I don't know about your little brother if that technically counts. Giant isopod. Actually, we've got an episode coming out soon on the Brave Wilderness channel about isopods. Okay. Sharks. I Sharks. Okay. You've seen some sharks. That's good. Hellbender. I saw a hellbender in there. That's one of the stranger ones. Maybe you saw that on a Brave Wilderness video. Um, oh, of course, I knew I was going to eventually see this one. Somebody has seen Bigfoot. Yep, of course. I hope you got either a good photo or some video footage of Bigfoot. Scorpions. Scorpions, rattlesnakes. Okay, wow, you guys got a lot of answers flying in there. Yes, technically all strange creatures. And out of those, I would say maybe the jellyfish is the strangest. Jellyfish are pretty strange creatures when you really think about it. So, okay, great answers, guys, to question number one. And to get our brains going, to really get those thinking powers going, let's do one more question before we get into tonight's lesson. Why do some animal species look so strange? What do you guys think? I'm gonna kind of go through these answers as you guys are selecting what you think is the right one. Is it because of obscure camouflage patterns that help keep them hidden from predators? Maybe. Is it an animal's design that can attract mates during breeding season? Hmm, looking different can be attractive. Is it the bizarre features that help certain predators lure in unsuspecting prey? 
Is it unique physical attributes that are an adaptation of surviving certain environments? Hmm, what do you guys think? Be a couple more seconds. All right, I think we got a lot of really smart members out there in our audience tonight because if you picked E, all of the above, you were absolutely right. All of the above, nature is filled with strange adaptations so that animals can find ways to survive. And tonight, we're going to talk about many of these elements. We want to talk about what shapes the look of an animal. We're going to start with environment, competition, and survival, which are all incredibly important when it comes to being a part of the natural world. So our first thing that we're going to talk about tonight, what shapes the design and look of an animal? One of the most important things is the environment. The environment strongly influences the way an animal looks by creating certain pressures that allow species to develop specific adaptations that will allow for the best chances of survival. Remember, the better that you adapt to your environment, the better your chances of surviving. And here's a great example. If you live up in the canopy of the rainforest and you have a prehensile tail, that means a tail that can do things like wrap around tree branches to help you hold on to things, it's going to benefit you as compared to having uh, that same adaptation living in a flat desert environment. If you're out on the desert sands with a prehensile tail, what are you grabbing onto? Maybe little rocks or twigs, but if you're up in the trees and your tail can wrap around a branch, it may help you reach just a bit further to be able to get your meal. Now, the next thing when it comes to shapes, uh, or the next thing I should say is competition for resources in the environment between different species. Competition is everything when it comes to survival. And when we're competing for resources, creatures create specializations and niches. These pressures often create the most bizarre species in the world. And here's a great example of how competition drove one certain animal to look completely different than anything else in its environment, the giraffe. Do you guys know why giraffes evolved to have long necks? I imagine you could guess that's so that they can reach high up into the trees to get their food. This allowed them to no longer have to compete with the lower level grazers. Of course, also being bigger makes them more of a threat if a potential predator were to come into the environment. But when it comes to having a long neck, nothing beats the giraffe and there's nothing else on our planet that has evolved quite like the giraffe to be able to specialize in getting food from its competition. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so next up, when it comes to eyes being beautiful, things being beautiful in the environment, we've got the beauty that is in the eyes of the beholder. Now, not all animals technically are considered beautiful, but I guess, like I said, that's in the eyes of the beholder. I think snapping turtles are absolutely adorable, but some people probably look at a snapping turtle and they're like, oh, coyote, this thing's covered in mud and slime and leeches and its skin's all bumpy. What's cute about a snapping turtle? But it's human perception that defines if an animal looks strange. In nature, the name of the game is survival, and the way a species looks has a specific pur purpose. Often, it's animals that we rarely see that appear to be the strangest. This is mainly due to the lack of familiarity that we have in seeing certain animals. Here's a great example. If you saw a bird for the first time, think about how strange it would be to see an animal with no hands yet it's something that's completely covered in feathers. Now for the bird, that is completely normal, but if you'd never seen a bird before and you were only used to seeing things with hands and no feathers, you might look at that animal and say to yourself, that is totally weird and strange looking. Yet some birds may be on the ugly side of things while others can be completely beautiful. Let's think about the comparison between a peacock and a turkey vulture. Turkey vultures have evolved to have bald heads that are just skin because when they dig into the carcass of an animal to eat all the rotting guts, you don't want all the parasites that's in that rotting animal to get into your feathers. So that adaptation has allowed the turkey vulture to evolve in a way that may not make it the most beautiful, but it allows it to get its food. Now, another perception of beauty that also helps to survive is humans are attracted to certain species or afraid of others in part based on visual survival mechanisms that we have. And here's an example. If something looks strange, 
chances are we should leave it alone just in case it can cause us harm. And a great example of that, is, well, I could come up with a gazillion examples of that, but one that I really love, we did an episode on recently for our series called Brave the Wild, was the stonefish. The stonefish is an incredibly well camouflaged marine fish that just has to lay on the basin of the ocean. It's really bizarre looking and super camouflaged, but it is also armed with incredibly sharp spines and a very toxic venom. Now that venom is not used to kill its prey. It's used as a defense in case something comes into the environment, tries to bite it, or in the worst case for a human, if you step on it. So it's all about being in tune with your environment when you go out looking for things. But a lot of these animals have evolved to have a certain look or design that helps them to survive. And whether you think they're beautiful or they're ugly, their look fits exactly what it is that they need to be a part of our planet. So there you have it. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder and the shape of certain animals and the look of a certain animal is what they use to help them survive in the environment. Tonight, as you guys know, everything is about the strangest and the most bizarre of creatures. Now, before we get into our next question, I know I've talked about a couple of things tonight that are already on the dangerous side of things, stonefish and snapping turtles. And I just have to kind of say as a warning for all you that are getting ready to head out this spring and summer to embark upon adventures of your own. Remember, the stuff that I do, I've been practicing at for many, many years. And I always work with professionals when I'm on location and sometimes working with species I'm not familiar with. So whenever there's a doubt in your explorations this summer, admire animals for a, from a safe distance if you can't properly identify identify it as being a harmless species. What I mean by harmless, I mean salamanders, crayfish, frogs, grizzly bears. No, no, wait, not grizzly bears. Grizzly bears, not safe to interact with. But any cool reptiles, amphibians, insects, and arachnids that are non-venomous that you find in your backyard are completely safe to interact with. Sound good? All right, you guys ready to move on to the next part of tonight's lesson? I hope you are ready for another question because it is question time. I love this one. Which animal do you think is the ultimate stranger thing? Is it the alligator snapping turtle? Is it the frogfish? I think the frogfish is super bizarre. Is it the giant isopod? Is it the helgramite? Oh, have you guys seen the episode that I did on the helgramites? That was terrible. Not terrible as in the production was terrible. It was terrible an experience getting up close with that stranger alien. Helgramite or platypus, which I've actually never done an episode on a platypus. I saw one once in a while, but they're incredibly fast and tough to get up close with. So what do you guys think? What is the ultimate stranger thing? A, B, C, D, or E? Got your answers? The correct answer, yet again, is, well, actually, they're all correct. There isn't an all above. I thought there was an all above. Every answer is correct. If you pick the alligator snapping turtle, if you pick the frogfish, if you pick the giant ice above the platypus or the helgramite, technically, you got the right answer. Because in my book, they're all strange. And technically, in nature, they're strange as well. So all answers are correct. I guess that was kind of a trick question. Actually, I almost tricked myself because I thought there was a F all of the above, which I guess I could have put that in there, but hey, you gotta love making lesson plans, right? All right, so you guys are doing great with the questions so far. Are we ready to talk about tonight's Stranger Things lineup? It's a good one. I picked them all. You guys ready? Okay, so I'll give you this picture here. See that slide? See if you can guess what all of those things are. I think there's probably one that you'll definitely know, Another that you might if you watch Brave Wilderness, and I'm thinking too that even when I look at the picture, I'm like, it's hard to tell exactly what that is. So first up is the horseshoe crab, one of the stranger creatures on our planet. And what you guys are going to see up here on the screen is a little video from our horseshoe crab episode. Uh, this is the opening moment when I stumbled upon the horseshoe crab, and in this instance. I thought it was a turtle. It looked just like a turtle as it was moving through this grass on the edge of this, uh, I, I guess this, I thought maybe it was a sea turtle because you wouldn't have a freshwater turtle in the ocean like this. But as I realized it was a horseshoe crab, ran up to it, picked it up, and I knew we had to get an episode on this thing because 
It looks like something out of an alien movie. Look at the top of its head. It looks like a helmet. And then of course you've got this long spiny thing coming off the back of it. The underside looks like a nightmare between a spider and a crab. And your first thought is probably, this thing has gotta be able to bite me or sting me or maybe crawl inside of my stomach and eat me from the inside out. But truth be told, the horseshoe crab is a completely harmless species. They do not bite, they do not sting, they can pinch you a little bit with those legs underneath, but it's nothing that's even powerful enough to break skin. And in all of my journeys across the world, I have to say that finding horseshoe crabs in the state of Maine, by the way, that's where we filmed this episode, in the state of Maine, the horseshoe crab was one of the most bizarre, stranger things creatures I think we have ever featured on the Brave Wilderness channel. And we actually have the idea of going back to film horseshoe crabs when they're going through their mating season. And when that happens, thousands of them flood in towards the shoreline and you can walk along the beach and for miles, you will see nothing but horseshoe crabs. And while you may look at them and say, okay, now I know a little thing from this class or from watching Brave Wilderness that they're not gonna bite or sting me. And if you see a horseshoe crab flipped upside down on its back, the best thing to do is safely walk up, gently flip it over upright, and it will be a very happy horseshoe crab. But again, the thing to take away from the horseshoe crab is they do not bite, they do not sting. They are just stranger things of the animal world. Maybe the strangest? I don't know if it's the strangest. When I really think about the grand scheme of things that I've worked with, it is up there in the top five for sure. I hope that you guys all get the chance to see a horseshoe crab, maybe this spring, maybe this summer, if you're vacationing along the East Coast. It is possible they're out there. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next strange creature. Oh, look at that guy. What are we looking at? It's an octopus, and we're gonna get a little video time here with an octopus that I caught in South Africa. Now, I've caught a handful of octop octopi or octopods, octopuses. It has like multiple plurals, but the, the technical term is octopi, if you want to pluralize these guys. And this one that I caught um, was just your basic common octopus. Um, I don't think he was anything too crazy, special, or rare, but... Whenever I interact with octopus, I have to be careful because they have a very sharp beak that's basically at the center of their body, which they use to bite a hole into their prey. And they are technically venomous. All octopi are venomous. And while they're not really aggressive, there are some species that are considered lethal. The most dangerous one is the blue ring octopus in Australia. And it's got a neurotoxic venom that is very fast acting. So if you're in Australia and you're in the tide pools and you flip over a rock and you see an octopus, do not, whatever you do, do not try to catch it because the bite could be the last bite you ever receive. But when it comes to the other octopus species um, throughout our coastlines, most of them are rather harmless, but they're incredibly difficult to catch and hold on to. So my recommendation would always be that if you see an octopus, if it stays out in the open for you, admire it. And the coolest thing about octopus, or one of the coolest things, gosh, there's a lot of really cool things. They can shoot ink. Basically, they, exu they exert the ink and then they force water out of something called a siphon. And that siphon pushes the water into the ink and that creates that cloud of black gunk in the water that you see, which they use to get away from their potential predators. They also are absolute masters of camouflage. And that episode that we were just seeing clips from, there are points where we let the octopus stop moving and it would completely take the form and the color of its surrounding environment. How cool is that for an adaptation? If speed and black ink can't allow you to escape, pure camouflage will do the trick. And as a last resort, maybe a bite from that sharp beak, but hopefully none of you ever experience a bite from an octopus. So when it comes to stranger things in the animal kingdom, 
I would say that the octopus definitely ranks up there with being one of the top five strangest. And did you know, and I'm not going to go on a science tangent about this, but some scientists have written papers that octopus may actually be aliens. For real. This is real scientific research that has been done. I won't say anything more than that. If you're really curious, go out and read some of the articles that have been written. But how crazy would that be if we found out that these octopi are actually from another planet? Anything's possible when it comes to Stranger Things, right? All right, moving on to our next creature. Oh, I love this guy. Absolutely love it. No, it is not a porcupine. No, it is not related to a porcupine. It's an echidna, a, a, an egg-laying mammal. It is a monotreme. And we filmed this adorable little long piggy snouted creature in Australia. And I'll give you guys a couple seconds to absorb what's happening there. You're probably thinking, Coyote, were those spines going into your hand? Yeah, it's like holding on to a pin cushion. Uh, and the difference between an echidna and something like a porcupine is that they don't lose their quills. So the quills are used as a defense to ward off predators, but they're not gonna stick into your snout or into your hands. But in the process of holding this little ball of spiky love, uh, I got a lot of pinpricks into my hand and there was some bloodshed in case anybody's interested. Look at those little tiny feet. How cute are they? They feel like the feet of an opossum. They're very grippy and echidna are excellent diggers. And you can see those long front claws. They're, it's almost like a badger's claws. And the echidna, what it will do is dig down into the ground very quickly and then use its spikes as protection for anything that's trying to eat it. So what in the world would want to eat something like an echidna? Well, in Australia, they have dingoes, which are kind of the equivalent of a mix between a coyote and a wolf in Australia. If a dingo could flip an echidna over on its stomach and get to the soft parts, it'd probably make a pretty good meal. But good luck getting through all those spikes. And for anybody that loves Sonic the Hedgehog, yes, Knuckles, the red guy with the fists that punches, he is an echidna. So that character in the video game realm is based off of that animal, which I bring that up because I recently saw an article the other day, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is in production right now and Knuckles is going to be a part of that movie. So if you're a big Sonic the Hedgehog fan, just like me, you're going to love seeing Knuckles in Sonic 2. Um, but there you go, the echidna, a very bizarre creature. Uh, and I only kind of touched on this at the beginning of talking about it. I feel like I could talk for 20 minutes about the echidna. The echidna lays eggs, a mammal that lays eggs. So it's covered in spines, it digs, it lays eggs, it has a long pig-like snout. They dig and eat little grubs and termites and stuff in the ground. Bizarre, right? Just the strangest of the strange. Australia has all kinds of strange things, but the echidna in the grand scheme of Australian bizarreness, I'd say probably ranks in like the top three, maybe? Maybe it's number one. Platypus is pretty strange too, also related to the echidna, a monotreme that lays eggs. Oh, we could go on forever about the strange things that live in Australia, but we're going to move on to our last strange creature of the evening. Oh my gosh, what are we looking at? What is happening in that picture? That thing is latched onto my neck. And you guys now are watching this video of these squirmy things inside of a tank. And if you watch Brave Wilderness, I'm sure you saw this video that came out last year, Eaten Alive by Sea Lamprey. This was the ultimate experiment in extreme and bizarre. Now, sea lamprey are a parasitic species that lives in the Great Lakes. They're technically invasive. They started out in the Atlantic Ocean and they migrated inward and now they're in all of our Great Lakes. And they suction cup onto the side of a fish. You see it suction cupping there onto the glass and maybe they're gonna suction cup onto my arms. We don't know yet but they suction cup onto a fish and they use their teeth to grapple on. And then they use their raspy tongue like a drill to cut a hole in the fish and they suck out the bodily fluids and the blood and sometimes the guts. Why? 
Why? Bizarre, right? Like the craziest of bizarre creatures. So what did I do? I put my hands and arms into the tank to see if they'd bite me. But they didn't. Why didn't they bite me? Well, probably because I'm a mammal and I'm warm-blooded. Sea lampreys specialize in eating fish, cold-blooded fish. I don't smell like a fish. I don't taste like a fish. And even for the second part of that episode, which we didn't show you a clip of there, you got to go to the Brave Wilderness channel and watch it. I induced a suction where I stuck a sea lamprey ah, on my neck, one on my arm, and one on my stomach to see if it would eat my blood and bodily fluids. Now, as a warning, there is some blood in this episode because it did drill down into my skin and that suction power, which is like the ultimate Hoover vacuum cleaner, does bring blood up from your skin. But the second that lamprey tasted Coyote Peterson's blood, bleh, spit me out like I was a rotten potato. That's right, sea lamprey do not want to eat human blood, bodily fluids, or organs. So don't worry. If you go swimming in the Great Lakes this summer, if you're even lucky enough to see a lamprey, there's no way it's going to suction onto you and eat you like you're the meal of an alien. But they're pretty bizarre, right? Pretty strange. I would say the ultimate stranger thing in my experience, in my travels. There's the creepy factor. There's the bizarre factor. There's the ultimate stranger thing factor. And there you have it. Sea lampreys our number four and bizarre strangest thing of the night. Crazy, right? I like my mind is still trying to process probably with you guys. Wait a minute, you suctioned a sea lamprey onto your body? Yeah, I did three times in case you didn't see that episode. And if you like that episode, I've got the best news in the world for you. I'm going to give you a little sneak peek tonight here just on Varsity Tutors for everybody that's tuned in. We are doing another sea lamprey video this summer called the sea lamprey dunk tank, where I'm going to be dropped into a tank with 500 lamprey and a special pheromone that causes them to go into fight or flight mode. What do you guys think is going to happen? Ooh, I can't wait either. We're filling in next month. So stay tuned. That will be out later this summer on the Brave Wilderness channel. Now, who's ready for another question? I feel like we're so entranced in all of the bizarreness and stranger thingness, stranger thingsness of tonight's class. It's time for another question. All right. Which one of the following is not a real animal adaptation for survival? Is it A, a wiggly tongue that looks like a worm? What? That's weird. Is it B, lumpy skin that looks like tree bark? Sounds like somebody just needs to lotion more. Is it C, laser beam eyes that melt frozen surfaces? Hmm, that sounds pretty awesome. Or is it D, suction cup toes to walk on glass? Give you guys a couple seconds to think about that. Well, I take a drink of water. Okay, got your answers? If you picked letter C as not being a strange adaptation for survival, you're right. I was going to say you're wrong because I feel like the laser beam eyes would be the coolest thing. But no, no animals have laser beam eyes that can melt surfaces for survival. So hopefully you guys all got that one. I thought it was kind of fun. Um, okay, so the next part of our lesson tonight, how can I find and admire stranger things in nature? Look at that frog. Frogs aren't really that strange unless you really look at them in their environment. Look at those big bulbous eyes. Crazy, right? Now, a frog, like I mentioned earlier, is probably one of the safest strange things you could get up close with this summer. But when it comes to searching for stranger things in nature, it's as simple as searching in distinct environments. Here's a couple of things I want you guys to remember. It helps to determine what type of ecosystem is in your area. That plays a very important role when it comes to finding animals. You can also look at field guides to determine what species are native in your area. So now you know the environment, now you know the species, you can head out on the adventure and start your search. Now, some of the most bizarre species 
are often hidden from view and live under rocks, logs, tree crevices, or are nocturnal and can only be seen at night, which means if you're brave enough to head out, ask your parents or go with your parents or with a friend, go out at night with a flashlight, explore around the edges of swamps, uh, near the edges of creeks, as long as you're being safe, you will probably see some pretty bizarre creatures. And you don't really even have to go far. You can go right into your backyard and all sorts of insects and arachnids are drawn into the lights near our house during the summer. The insects and arachnids then draw in the reptiles and amphibians, and then sometimes the mammals. So right in your own backyard, you can find some pretty cool stuff. Now, strange doesn't necessarily have to be rare. And here's another thing I want you to remember. A fun practice is to observe common animals in your area and try to point out what the animal's strangest adaptations or features are. Remember, a raccoon or a squirrel might come across as common, but for a person in another region of the world, it might be super strange and exotic. Where I live, we've got raccoons all over the place. Raccoons, possum, fox. Um, I actually had somebody that was in town visiting me from the entire other side of the country who had never seen an opossum before. One was in my backyard and it was like the coolest thing ever. So, and it's fair to say that opossum are really cool. Uh, marsupials, they have more teeth than any other mammal. They got a bald prehensile tail. Okay, the opossum could have been on our Stranger Things list tonight for sure. But the point I'm trying to make is that just because it's in your yard may seem commonplace to you, could be super bizarre to somebody else. So it's all about looking at the features on that animal to determine how bizarre and how strange it truly is. So those are some cool tips that hopefully you guys will take with you into this spring and summer for adventuring. Remember, only approach and interact with the animals if you can properly identify them. And like something like an opossum or a raccoon, you definitely don't want to try to feed it. You don't want to try to catch it, admire something like that from a safe distance. But frogs, salamanders, turtles, as long as they're not snapping turtles, are all totally safe to find and get up close with this summer. Um, okay, so real quick, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek as to what is coming up in my world. Um, we've got a trip coming up to Florida in the very near future, and I know a lot of you have loved the snake venom milking episodes, and we may be talking about snake venom in a future segment here on Varsity Tutors, but we're getting ready to do some more venom milking episodes. Stay tuned for those. That will be my next production trip. And as a conclusion, um, Brian, I see you're jumping in here. Did you want to say something before we get into the conclusion? Oh, man, I was just getting excited to, okay. uh, one, I have a pop quiz for you in a second. Uh, hmm. I want to remind everybody to get their cameras ready because that's coming up next. But uh, yeah, don't let me step on the conclusion. Okay, cool. I didn't know if you, if you jumped in because you wanted to throw something in there. And so as a conclusion to today's Stranger Things of the Animal Kingdom, the natural world is filled with stranger things that have evolved what we perceive to be bizarre appearances. But for the organism, it's just a means of survival. It's within the strange, it's, it, it is within the stranger things that we can learn the most about the natural world and ultimately realize that all species are strange to a certain degree. And it's what makes them all special and ultimately worth protecting. So hopefully you guys learned something cool tonight. My next class is coming up in June. I believe it's June 15th, right, Brian? Yes, sir. June 15th. So mark those June calendars. 15th. Yes. And it's going to be a good one because we've gone through the dangerous. We've gone through the strange. I think it's time we get into the cute and cuddly. So our next class is called Cute and Cuddly and Curious Creatures. So if you love things like adorable baby sloths, I promise you this is going to be the class for you. All right, glad those calendars are marked. And I've got a few other instructions for everyone here. Um, we're going to give you an opportunity to take a picture with Coyote in just a second to get those cameras ready. We're also going to do questions and answers. So if you haven't asked questions, get those ready. While you're getting those cameras ready, I've got a pop quiz for you, Coyote, because the most popular question wasn't really a question. It was kind of an answer, but sort of like our, our multiple choice um, Stranger Things question from before. A lot of people wanted to volunteer that they are your biggest fan. So I want to ask you, is your biggest fan Trent, Wesley, Beckett, Sadie? Uh, who else we got in here? Caden. We've got a whole bunch of these. Will, who's your, who's your biggest fan? Or is it another one of those? There should be an answer. All of the above. <sighs> 
It is, it is Z, all of the above. If you are watching Brave Wilderness or Brave the Wild or being a part of these Varsity Tutors classes, you are without question a, an incredible member of the Coyote Pack. We couldn't do the work that we do without the audience out there watching. And I'm just thrilled to be able to bring you guys animal education, conservation, and entertainment. And the fact that we can combine them all together and keep you guys loving animals, that's the most important thing at the end of the day. If you love and watch animals, you our biggest fan. So there you have it from the man himself. You are his biggest fan. Hopefully that puts a smile on your face because it is time for the selfie contest. Remember when you take that picture with Coyote, if you upload it to Instagram and tag Coyote Peterson and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win that hat and an entry in Wildlife Creature Camp this summer with Varsity Tutors. There's a link on your screen if you want to learn more. Even if you don't win, you can still enroll. We'll be uh, talking about all the stranger things, cute and cuddly things, all kinds of exciting things in the animal kingdom. Plus, uh, you have a chance, uh, and you do have that even right now, if you go to the Varsity Tutors Learning Lab, to take some challenges hosted by Coyote. I'm talking a lot. Let me not get that smile off your faces, Coyote. I'm going to turn it back to you because actually, I don't know if you want smiles. Maybe you want strange faces for a Stranger Things class. Or maybe we can do one of each, but uh, everybody, let's get those pictures. Yeah, we'll do, uh, here's what we'll do. We'll do the uh, strange face first. I think we did this last time. We did a strange, or we did a scary and a normal. So we'll do the strange face first. What I'll do is I'll give you guys a countdown, three, two, one, and then I'll hold my strange face for as long as I can. You make your own strange face, take the selfie. Uh, I'll hold that for about 15 seconds, and then we'll go into just a normal happy smiling face. Sound good? All right, here we go. Go. We're going to do the countdown. Three, two, one. I think that was about 15 seconds. That was all, that's a hard face to hold. I've never made that face before. I don't have any idea what it was, but hopefully it came out good on you guys' selfies. All right, we'll do a big smile face now. I'll count down from three. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. I all think right. we got it. And, and got Coyote, it. like true to form all the way, uh, you know, you're a great teacher, man, bringing the callback <laughs> back competition. Why do things look strange as they're competing? Everyone that was competing to get the strangest picture on Instagram tonight was making the most strange and bizarre face they could think of. So in a way we all learned a little bit about animal competition uh, just by taking that picture. So we're excited to see all your pictures coming up pretty soon. You guys have been asking some amazing questions as well. So, uh, so we'll get to to those right now i think one of the most common ones um we got coyote was how do you know about all of these animals they're they're such crazy animals and you've been listing you know strange animals through throughout that are you know in, in all kinds of exotic places how do you even find out about all these let alone uh you know figure out where to go visit and, uh, and do shows with them great question well to be honest guys it all really starts with books and research uh, ever since I was little, I spent hours and hours scouring books at the library from encyclopedias to specialized books about certain species. And that's really what was a huge influence for me early on. And once you see a certain animal that you gravitate toward, you know, for me, it was the snapping turtle, both the common and alligator snapping turtle. You become really interested in something. Therefore, you teach yourself more about it. Once you start to grab that education to hold on to it, as I grew up and started creating a career in, in production and in animal adventures, um, it just became a matter of going back in my mental catalog of things that I always wanted to see, reaching out to the right either conservation groups or research teams to get myself and the team in the right spot to have a chance to see these animals in the wild. So long story short, it all starts with books. The more you put into your research, the more you will learn and the better your chances you'll have of ultimately seeing something. 
All right. So one of the best places to see Stranger Things of the Animal Kingdom this summer is at the library. And uh, then maybe you'll see some on your way there or uh, your way home as well. But in those books, you'll find out exactly what you're looking for and uh, and be better equipped to look for them. So perfect. Hey, another question that came up a lot. Uh, people were interested in the uh, the classifications of, uh, of certain animals. Um, definitely the sea lamprey and a rodent, another one to have a giant isopod. Those were a couple people wanted to know, like, hey, are those fish, amphibians, you know, mammals? You know, we, we got, you talked about a couple of those, but people want to know a couple of classifications, specifically the isopod and uh, the sea lamprey. Yeah, the isopod is like its own unique thing. And I'd honestly have to go back and look. I don't know offhand what like genus that falls into. Um, but they're super primitive creatures, as are the sea lamprey. And the sea lamprey are their own unique creature as well. They're considered a parasitic fish species. Um, but they're really different than, and than anything else that's out there. They don't have a proper skeletal structure. They don't have proper jaws. Um, those really prehistoric level animals, I think are the things that always classify as being some of the most bizarre. Um, and when it comes to, you know, for anybody out there that really wants to do research on any specific animal, um, the way genus and species and all that breaks down into the you know phylums, kingdoms, all of that is a really great thing to learn for yourself, even at a really young age, to understand how the animal kingdom is structured. And then when you get want to get really, really specialized all the way down into the genus and the species of things, that's where it becomes really, really complex. But it can be really fun, um, especially when you're trying to pinpoint a specific animal species. And myself and Mario. Uh, when we do a lot of research for the episodes that we produce, we spend a lot of time looking for a specific species. And then if we can identify and actually find that one species, it's a little more unique as compared to just generalizing something as, um, uh, let me think of a good example. Well, here's a great example. Uh, recently, we just filmed an episode in Arizona on recluse spiders. Now, I'm sure you all have heard of the brown recluse, uh, which is the most venomous spider species in the United States, one of the most popular, but it's also one of the most misidentified because the actual brown recluse has a certain range that it lives within. And while there are many other recluse species, there's only one that is actually considered the brown recluse. So we had to do a lot of research when we found the spider we were going to film with because we were like, this is a brown recluse. And Mario's like, we are outside of the range of the brown recluse. And while it really looks like a brown recluse, I don't think that it is. So lo and behold, we had to do a lot of research. What we found was a desert recluse, which can only be found in Southwestern Arizona and the edge of California and a little bit into New Mexico. So there you have it. You got to do your research to make sure that you've got the proper animal identified before you film with it. It's crazy, right? Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for that. I think that, um, you know, the learning is, is key to, uh, to all of these kind of things. And I know you and I were talking to that, you know, there are a lot of dangerous situations you're in, but having done that research, like you were talking about the different types of spiders is the key to making sure we want you to come back safe from all those adventures. And that research is, uh, is really what allows you to do it. So a um, lot of answers in books. We've got a lot of people throwing out uh, that they also want to be considered as biggest fans. So uh, Cody Reese, uh, Malia, my, Madeline, John, Adrian, Marcus, Emerson, Cody. Um, I think you guys were, that's why he said answer choice Z was right because uh, we didn't even get to the end of that list. So, um, so that's, that's pretty perfect. Um, one question that came in, I want to make sure this isn't a how to, because uh, we want to admire safely. So let's say, how did you, um, how do you go about catching an octopus? Oh, good question. Well, believe it or not, I have seen many that have gotten away and Again, I don't want to ever encourage anybody to try to catch an octopus because technically they're all venomous. They can bite. Some can even be considered deadly. Um, but the ones that you'll find around the coastlines of the United States, for the most part, are totally safe to interact with. And if you are going to interact with an octopus, even though I tell you not to, I know everybody's going to go do what they're going to do. The best thing is to always try to gently coax it into a bucket of water. That is the safest way to interact with it. You could scoop it up with a little dip net if it's out in the open, get it into a bucket of water. Um, you don't want to try to hold on to it. They're incredibly slippery and slimy. Um, you can let it walk over your hand, but keep it low to the ground. You don't want to drop it. But if you can gently coax it into a bucket of water and admire it for a few, few seconds, that's the best way to go about it. Safest for you and safest for the octopus. 
Awesome. And thank you for mentioning that too. Safest for the octopus. You know, these, these animals are fascinating, but we want to make sure that they stay safe too. So other people can be fascinated by them or so they can just live their, their lives happily. So um, perfect. Thank you. All right. I think we've got time for one more, another really common one that came out. I should also mention if, uh, if you didn't get your name read on air, Coyote still loves you and uh, you can, you know, continue to chat those in or maybe the best way to, uh, to make sure he knows exactly how much, uh, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you love him and, and he and there, therefore loves you is get that Instagram photo up there. So, uh, so you can actually see, uh, you know, how much uh, you guys were having fun together tonight. So one last question for you, we're talking about strange animals, um, but animals also, they've got eyes and senses and things. Do animals think that we're strange or what things do we do that, uh, that either, you know, maybe get on animals nerves or make them think we're strange. How do, how do animals think about us? That's a great question. I tell you what, if I had the real true answer to that, I'm sure I could write a pretty awesome book on it. I don't know that anybody really knows, but I do believe that animals have a certain level of emotion that they exude towards people that they may or may not recognize. An animal in the wild is obviously going to look at a human as first and foremost, likely being a threat, whether they perceive us as being bizarre or strange it's tough to determine. Almost all animals want nothing to do with humans. So they think, okay, I got to go in the opposite direction. I got to dive down into the water. I got to get out of here before somebody tries to catch me or hurt me. When it comes to an animal that is your pet, um, you know, I've got a couple of baby snapping turtles that are very much in tune with recognizing me and very curious anytime I walk over to their uh, aquarium. Um, and I believe that animals probably do look at us in a slightly bizarre fashion. But when it comes to your household pets, whether they're reptiles, amphibians, insects, arachnids, dogs, or cats, they also perceive us as being like, are you going to feed me? Are you going to pet me? What do you got for me? What about me? What about me? What about me? So I don't know that they so much think we're bizarre as much as they think, what's in it for me, guy? Come on. I know I'm either going to get fed here or you're going to try to clean my cage and you're going to make me really angry. So what's happening? So um, I don't know. I think Animals probably look at us as being providers if they're in our household. And if they see us in the wild, most likely perceive us as a threat. But are we bizarre? I think probably in, in many ways, because we're walking on two legs. Most animals are walking on four. So they're probably thinking to themselves, what is that thing doing running around on two legs? So yeah. Oh yeah. We wear bizarre clothing. You know, we're eating stuff out of wrap. We're wearing clothing Actually, period. You yeah, know? exactly. There's uh, I, I always think when you kind of look at it, you know, Hey, that animal is kind of strange looking. It's like, what in the world must it think about me? You right. Know, right. Races and uh, you know, wearing hats and whatever. And so, yeah. uh, so we're, we're probably in, in terms of what the average, you know, being on earth thinks we might be the strangest animals of all, but um, so just, it's good to remind ourselves where, uh, where we fit in. Hey, Coyote, thank you so much. Uh, when I say we're the strangers, I don't mean you're, uh, you may be, uh, we've got a lot. We're of all strange. We there. love being strange. Uh, it's good. Perfect. Well, hey, thanks so much for sharing this with us. We're excited to see you back uh, in June um, for the, the Cute and Cuddly Creatures class. So everybody get excited about that. If you want more Coyote in the meantime, you can run into the Varsity Tutors Learning Lab and uh, do some creature challenges hosted by Coyote. Um, this will be up on YouTube if you want to share with your friends pretty soon. But the next uh, big uh, instruction for all of you, we want to make sure you've got an opportunity to, uh, to win that hat and join us for uh, wildlife creature camp this summer. So there's a link on your screen to check out the camp. Um, here are the instructions to, uh, to join the photo contest on Instagram. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll leave everybody um, here. Huge thanks to Coyote. Thanks to all of you for your participation and your question. I think you're all really big fans and proved it tonight. And uh, we'll see y'all back here real soon. So thanks everybody. Thanks guys.